Birds do it, bees do it, some educated fleas do it, let's do it. Let's talk about gay sex in the animals. Why does same-sex mating and same-sex attraction happen in the animal kingdom? Hmm, well there are some very good reasons. Let's talk about it. So if we haven't met before, I'm Kay, this is Ecstatic Self. Please go ahead and hit the subscribe button and the notifications next to it so you can keep up to date on fabulous things regarding queerness, spirituality, and coming into wholeness. Today I'm responding to a question that one of my followers asked. My family really struggles to accept me. Could you please create a video explaining why gayness is natural, normal, and exists, period? Well, I am happy to talk about those things because talking about how queerness is awesome is one of my favorite things to do. So, in case you didn't know already, almost every animal species demonstrates some form of same-sex mating behavior, whether that be in lifelong partnerships that exist between queer animal couples, like in the macaws, or if it's more random sexual play just for the hell of it and the enjoyment, like dolphins performing oral sex on one another in gay configurations. Gay love is rampant in the animal kingdom. So if it is so common and normal and commonplace, why do humans get their knickers in a twist over men loving men and women loving women? women. It's hard to exist on this planet with having heard somebody say, oh, that's sinful, you wouldn't be damned to hell, or that is wrong, or that is blah. Where do they get that from? It's not like we as humans are the only ones doing it. It is everywhere, including my dog when he goes to play with other dogs. He loves mounting other male dogs from the front, from behind, in their ear. It's part of enjoyment for him. But canines aside, why do we have so much feelings about this, especially because same-sex attraction is rampant in the human community? A recent poll by YouGov shows that 47% of millennials and Gen Zers identify as at least partially same-sex attracted. Nearly half. And if we include all the people who have feelings that they've never been able to admit to themselves, I'm gonna guess that, that number might be even higher. Why do we feel this way? Why do we shame people for what is natural to them, the way that they were created? It's a question I wish I had a better answer to. Why is there so much fear in us humans of that which is not purely heterosexual? What I can point to, however, is that there are some really good reasons why queerness exists in the animal world. Number one, queer animals provide diversity. Here's a big overarching assumption I'm going to make in this argument today. Mother Nature, Evolution does not care if you, as an individual person, continues to exist. We don't matter. Evolution, Mother Nature very much cares if our species exists, but if a chick falls out of its nest and dies, oh well, there's four more. Not a big deal. So let's get that argument out of the way. You, as an individualized person, from nature's point of view, doesn't matter. You could reproduce or not, you could live or not, so long as your society is thriving. Now what is the key to a successfully thriving species, animal group, whatever? Diversity of ideas, which is incidentally why it's so dangerous right now in America that we have no diversity of ideas, that everybody is just clamped down into these two camps and warring with one another. We need diversity, lighten up. Political commentary aside, diversity of ideas, diversity of experiences, a wide plethora of advantages is what allows a culture, a society, a species to grow and evolve. Right? We see even just with bacteria, right? COVID's happening right now, we're so afraid of COVID mutating. Why are we afraid of COVID mutating and becoming more dangerous? Because that's what we do, we change, we grow. That's how a, a nasty little coronavirus evolves. It takes in DNA, it exchanges with their current, it becomes something new and different. So the more diversity that exists within a group of individuals, within an animal branch of the evolutionary tree, the more likely it's going to be to thrive. And what does queerness bring us? The very word, the reason I love using the word queer, is queer means different. Same sex attracted animals are going to have slightly different vantages, slightly different perspectives. If you don't believe me, go sit in a group of gay men and then go sit in a group of straight men. Their views and perspectives will be very divergent. They will not be the same, right? That's part of the reason I did not fit into middle schools. I didn't know I was queer and I didn't want to hang out with the other queer kids. And I'm trying to hang out with the straight kids and I'm like, what are you talking about? I don't care about any of this shit. Let's throw glitter and decorate things. Not to be a stereotype, but sometimes I can be a bit of a stereotype. People who exist in the world in a slightly different way 
will provide new perspectives, new inventions, new ideas. And we see throughout history, the queer ones have often been the artists, the innovators, the scientists. They're the ones who see things that other people don't to provide that vantage. That sounds like a hell of a benefit to a society and evolution, wouldn't you say? Queerness in the animal kingdom provides new ways of hunting, fishing, building nests, building structures of society that will allow their cohorts to thrive. Because again, the individual doesn't matter, but we want to make sure that the society does. So that starts to break apart the argument, uh, well, why would God create uh, a, a person attracted to its own gender if they can't produce babies? Well, we don't need billions of babies. We need enough babies to thrive into maturity and reproduce themselves. Because what good is it if there's a hundred million offspring, but they all starve to death due to overcompetition? So that's actually another thing that queer or gay animals and humans actually help to benefit society by not claiming as many resources. So picture this, mother has seven kids, five of them are boys. If all five boys are out hunting for women and resources and resources for their own offspring, it's gonna be slim pickings. But what if the youngest two of those boys happen to also prefer men? Suddenly, they're not going to be hunting for the limited supply of women folk to reproduce with. They're not going to need to hoard resources and gold and food for their children. No, suddenly, they become available to help support the family structure that's already existing. They can help to raise their brother's children and their sister's children. They can create a stability in the family network because they don't need to migrate and go elsewhere. They can help root things down and ensure that the next generation survives better. This is one of the most important reasons that gay people exist from an evolutionary perspective. We add a buffer to society to help the next generation thrive because we're not going to compete for resources resources in the same way. And if you think it was just accidental that I said the youngest of the five boys was going to be gay, it wasn't. Studies have actually shown that the more boys a woman births, the greater likelihood with each successive birth that they will be same-sex attracted predominantly. There is scientific reasons to explain why this is so. Studies have shown that the higher the levels of testosterone in the womb, the greater likelihood that a child, a male child, will be born gay. And with each successive pregnancy of a boy, a mother's prenatal testosterone climbs significantly higher and higher with each pregnancy. What does this tell you? It says that nature doesn't want too many boys. It only needs a few, right? A man produces millions and millions and millions of sperm cells. They could impregnate and create children galore. And if you're Genghis Khan, you may have actually done that. Apparently a lot of people indigenous to Mongolia can trace their ancestry back to Genghis Khan because he was such a prolific seed spreader. <laughs> Isn't that fun? Rape. But in all seriousness, we don't need that many men out there spreading their seed. We need better caregivers. And not to stereotype gay men, but studies have shown that gay men are, statistically speaking, the least violent demographic between straight men, straight women, gay men, and gay women. We are least likely to engage in outer violence, which means that we are probably pretty darn good at being caregivers and supporters of a family structure. In the news over the past few years, there's been a lot of love given to the gay penguin couples that we've seen at zoos around the country. People love that the two little penguin dudes walk fin and fin and want to spend all their time around each other. Nature needs this. If we were to go down to Antarctica and find a newly orphaned penguin chick whose straight parents died in a walrus attack. Walruses, whom interestingly enough, also form lifelong same-sex partnerships and like to hold each other's little, little finny thing while they sleep. That chick will not be usually welcomed in by another opposite sex couple. They have their own chick or chicks to take care of. They've got to provide resources for them. The chick will likely starve to death. Unless there happens to be a same-sex penguin couple nearby. Same-sex penguin couples adopt orphaned chicks and raise them as if they were their own. And even when comparing between a same-sex couple and a single parent trying to raise a chick, the same-sex couple will have a much higher likelihood of raising that chick to maturity because of having the shared ability to provide protection and go hunt for food and other resources the chick needs. A chick is healthier and more likely to thrive if he has two parents, even if both of them are male. 
Now, when I was writing my book, Journey to the Ecstatic Self, I originally included this information in one of the chapters, a chapter on how everybody is a little bit queer. I actually removed it though, because there is this idea sometimes that we as queer people have to prove our worth, that we have to prove that we are valuable, that we have a purpose. We shouldn't have to do that because frankly, every living being is worthy of respect, belonging, care, kindness. We don't have to prove ourselves. We don't have to show that we are worthy of existing. We exist, therefore we are worthy. And that is true of every animal, every sentient creature. So my dear follower who requested this video, I'm so sorry that your family doesn't believe that you as you were created is valuable and magnificent. You shouldn't have to prove yourself to them. But we should prove to everybody we interact with, they are worthy of love and respect. We are worthy of love and respect. Every person is worthy of that. And if we as a society can focus on kindness, respect, generosity for our fellow sentient creatures, regardless of who they are or what they do, we will ultimately benefit everyone and we'll be happier and healthier. But I also recognize that coming into wholeness is not easy, it's not effortless, and to unlearn all of these paradigms that we've been taught of feeling less than, of feeling unworthy, of feeling broken because of our same-sex attractions or queer longings, it takes time. So I would like to invite you to take a few moments with me to just sit and breathe and connect with that worthiness that is inside. So I'd like to invite you to close your eyes, take a few deep breaths, and just sit here with yourself. Observe how you're feeling. Allow yourself to be wherever you are. And maybe place your hands on the center of your chest. Some call this area the Anahata Chakra. Some call it the heart center. Some call it the seat of the self. Breathe into this space and envision a glowing ball of light here in the middle of your chest beneath your palms. And say to yourself, I am beautiful. I am worthy. I am perfect just as I am. There is a reason I am the way that I am. I have nothing to prove. I am whole. I am magnificent. I am kind to myself and others. and then feel that light in the middle of your chest start to grow. Let it flare, let it ble let it beam. Feel it expand out past the limits of your skin until it shines like a beacon, like a light guiding others. Know that you are worthy of love and belonging. You are worthy of being treated well and you are worthy of the place you occupy on this planet. Don't let anyone ever make you feel bad or wrongly made. You are beautiful. You are magnificent. Take a deep breath and feel that resonate inside. Shanti, 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 peace, peace, peace. If you like that meditation, I'm now leading live meditation classes every Sunday, 6 p.m. Eastern time here on YouTube, followed by a short Q&A. So if anything comes up for you that you want to talk about, please feel free to join me. And that book I mentioned, Journey to the Ecstatic Self, a workbook for settling into your skin, cultivating authenticity, and reconnecting with your radiant self. It's available now on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, iTunes, wherever fine books are sold. Uh, but seriously, I would love it if you check it out. I put a lot of hard work into this, and it's a really great interactive journey to help you come into wholeness. And maybe gift it to somebody who you think is struggling with their own journey of coming into wholeness. Thank you for your time. Namaste.